Today we're going to be covering cranial nerves, and uh, let's let's take a look. We, we will also cover some special senses. We'll look at the eye, we'll look at the ear, and just a quick review on the neuron and the reflex arc. So when we look at the 12 cranial nerves, there's 12 pairs. They're actually numbered in the order that they're created embryologically within us. So if there's 12 cranial nerves, cranial nerve one is created first, olfactory. Then comes cranial nerve two, optic, cranial nerve three, oculomotor, four trochlear, five trigeminal, six abducens, seven facial, eight vestibulocochlear, nine glossopharyngeal, 10 vagus, 11 spinal accessory, 12 the hypoglossal. Now, how do you remember those? <clears throat> There's so many different mnemonics out there to help you try and recall the cranial nerves. Um, I find the easiest is OOO, to touch and feel very good velvet. Ah, A-H, OOO, to touch and feel very good velvet. Ah, A-H. So if you take the first letter of each of those, OOO, you get olfactory, optic, oculomotor, OOO, to touch, trochlear, trigeminal, and feel, abducens, facial, very good, vestibulocochlear, glossopharyngeal, velvet, vagus, ah, for 11 and 12, AH, 11 is the spinal, um, the accessory nerve, which is also spinal accessory, accessory nerve or spinal accessory. And then 12, H, hypoglossal. <clears throat> Let's look at some of their basic functions. When you look at cranial nerve one, now, besides knowing the cranial nerves and what they do, you need to know them by Roman numeral, as you see here, olfactory is one, Optic is two, oculomotor three, trochlear four, abducens five. Then we have um, cranial nerve six, which is, here it is, I'm sorry, cranial nerve five, uh, trigeminal cranial nerve six, abducens seven, facial eight, vestibulocochlear, nine, glossopharyngeal, 10, vagus, 11, accessory or spinal accessory, and 12, hypoglossal. You need to know them by name, Roman numeral, their function, but also where they come from. This helps us understand whenever there is brain injury or concussion or any type of insult or lesion to the brain, we can try and figure out at what level of the brain that lesion is at by simply testing cranial nerves. So the cranial nerve using those nerves is a window in to the brain. So if we think that there may be issues to cranial nerve um, to the medulla oblongata, we will test cranial nerve eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12, because that's where the nuclei of those cranial nerves originate in the medulla. If we think there's a problem above it in the pons, then we're gonna check five, six, and seven. If we think there's a problem in the midbrain, we'll check cranial nerves three and four. And if we think there's a problem in the cerebrum, we'll check cranial nerves one and two that we can see right here, one and two. <clears throat> olfactory is one, optic is two, where they crisscrosses the optic chiasm. So cranial nerve one is for the sense of smell. So the way I would test this, I would simply take maybe cinnamon, <clears throat> coffee, <clears throat> lemon, um, <clears throat> something that is, or vanilla, these are universal scents, no matter where you are in the world, everyone knows what gasoline smells like, what vanilla smells like, what cinnamon and coffee smells like. That's pretty much universal. So you can have those in a little bottle and you don't tell the patient, right? Okay, I have cinnamon, tell me if you can smell it. You're not, you don't approach it that way. You simply hold it under their nose, you have them close their eyes with their mouth shut. So they're only using olfactory sense. And you say, tell me if you can identify this odor or the scent. That's how that's done. Cranial nerve two is the optic nerve. Cranial nerve two, you would simply take a um, 
hold up a finger and say, how many fingers am I holding? Or how many fingers am I holding? Because cranial nerve two, optic is for vision. Can you see how many fingers? That's cranial nerve uh, two. Cranial nerve three is the ocular motor. You wanna be able, for this one, you could do two things. You could have them move the eye in a variety of positions, but you can also shine light into the eye, okay? And this is how I, I like to do it. So I'll take a pen light, I'll shine it in the eye. And if their optic nerve, which is cranial nerve two is working, then that means they can see, right? The brain is getting the message. And then what you'll see is the pupil constrict. That's what cranial nerve three does. It controls the constriction of the light. <clears throat> cranial nerve three also controls the muscles of the eye in moving the eye in a variety of positions. <clears throat> cranial nerve four also moves the eye and cranial nerve six moves the eye. So three, four, and six all move the eye. How do they move the eye? So once you know what cranial nerve four does and what cranial nerve six does, which only control one muscle each, the other movements and muscles are controlled by cranial nerve three. So cranial nerve six, if we look at the name, abducens, it means abduct. So if I covered my left eye and I followed the thumb outward, I am abducting my right eye. And if I contract that and follow it, my abducens nerve works, but so does my lateral rectus muscle because the lateral rectus moves the eye outward. If my lateral rectus is damaged or weak, secondary to damage to the abducens nerve, and I can't hold my eye out, the eye goes in, okay? Because the medial rectus, which is the antagonist, kicks in if the lateral rectus isn't contracting, okay? So we know what cranial nerve six does for abducens. What is cranial nerve four? Cranial nerve four is the trochlear, and the trochlear nerve goes to a muscle called the superior oblique. The superior oblique muscle moves the eye down and in. Okay, so we know abducens is this, down and in for superior oblique is this. So every other position that you move the eye, if it's in, if it's up and in, if it's up, if it's up and out, if it's down and out or straight down, that's how you would check cranial nerve three. It's all the other ones. So the way you can remember this is Lindner's chemical formulation, which is LR6, SO4, all over three. So LR6 is lateral rectus, sixth cranial nerve. That's LR6. SO4, superior oblique, fourth cranial nerve. And then all over six means all the other eye muscles are cranial nerve three. LR6, SO4, all over three. Lateral rectus, abducens nerve, superior oblique, trochlear nerve, all over three means all the other eye muscles and movements are controlled by the ocular motor, which is cranial nerve three. Okay, so we did cranial nerve one, two, three, four, six. I skipped five. Five is trigeminal. It's called trigeminal because if you look at the picture, there are tri, there are three branches to cranial nerve five. It's Roman numeral V, right, for five. So they will call it V1 would be the area in the green, V2 would be the pink area, V3 would be the mandibular area. V1, V2, V3, because there's three divisions, V for Roman numeral five. V1 is the ophthalmic region, V2 is the maxillary region, V3 is the mandibular region meaning sensation to the face. This is why when you go to the dentist and they give you or inject you with Novocaine, you half your face goes numb so the dentist can work on the upper jaw or lower jaw, but everything on your side of your face goes numb, including half of your tongue, okay? So you, they tell you, be careful not to chew because if you bite your tongue, you'll bleed and you won't even feel it. All right, so cranial nerve five has a sensory portion, but it also has a motor portion. The motor portion goes to your muscles of mastication. Muscles of mastication are your chewing muscles. Those are your time muscles, T-I-M-E. 
temporalis, internal pterygoid, masseter, and external pterygoid, T-I-M-E, thigh muscles, muscles of mastication. Okay, so cranial nerves can be sensory, they can be motor, or they can be both. Sensory would be like cranial nerve one and cranial nerve two are only sensory. Um, motor would be like cranial nerve three. It moves the eye and makes it constrict. That's all motor. When they're both, right, sensory and motor, that would be like trigeminal nerve, does sensory to the face, and it does motor to the muscles of mastication, okay? Cranial nerve seven is the facial nerve, and the cranial nerve seven also has a uh, motor and a sensory component. The motor component does all your facial expressions, raising your eyebrow, frowning, doing the Elvis, you know, with your upper lip, puffing out your cheek, smiling, frowning, anything that moves the uh, muscles of facial expression is cranial nerve seven, the facial nerve. It is involved in the condition called Bell's palsy, where half the face droops and the other half functions. Cranial nerve seven is also helps you blink to close the eye. So when someone blinks, if you're seeing an eye that stays open while the other one is blinking, then we know there's cranial nerve seven on the involved side. The sensory portion to cranial nerve seven is sweet, sour, salty seven. Sweet, sour, salty seven, sweet, sour, salty seven. So seven does the senses of sweet, sour, and salty to the anterior two thirds of the tongue. That means the front of the tongue detects sweet, sour, salty seven and salivary glands. So they're all S's, sweet, sour, salty, salivary glands, cranial nerve seven. Cranial nerve eight, that's the vestibular cochlear nerve. When you look at this picture here, you see here's the cochlear portion that looks like the shell of a snail. And then you have the vestibular portion that are these loops here, these canals. These are called the semicircular canals or the vestibular canals. And there's basically fluid that is in here in those semicircular canals. When you move your head forward, the fluid goes back. When you move your head back, the fluid goes forward. When you rotate left, the fluid goes right. When you go right, the fluid goes left. So it, everything moves in opposites. And these little hair-like filaments that are in those canals, and they basically help you to maintain your balance. Sometimes there are these little crystals that are in this uh, macula, in the dilated part of the vestibule. And they sometimes these calcium crystals get lodged and get stuck in those canals. And this is what creates this constant sense of movement or spinning in people that are referred to as vertigo. Sometimes they'll turn their head right and everything spins and they have to hold on to something for balance. Or when they get up, they have to hold on to everything, they lose their balance or turning in bed. Typically it's always a movement in one particular position. When those symptoms match up where you can always um, mimic and bring out those symptoms with a particular predictable movement. We call that benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, BPPV, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. And that means if they turn left and everything spins and you see nystagmus of the eyes, that is vertigo, that is very fixable, and it only takes about five minutes to do so. I treat several of these each year in the office. It is a mechanical problem and it's fixable. Sometimes it's a chemical problem and that one is much more difficult. You have to look at a lot of the medications and make sure that they are not ototoxic, meaning toxic to the ear, either to hearing or to your balance and equilibrium because those are much more difficult. The cochlear portion deals with hearing. So when you look at cranial nerve eight, vestibulocochlear, this is the vestibular portion, this is the cochlear portion. Cochlear is for hearing, vestibular is for balance. So it's one nerve that actually has two divisions, a cochlear division for hearing, a vestibular division for balance. Just think of the vestibular apparatus in the ear as like a carpenter's tool, where you have like 
this straight tube that has fluid and there's an air bubble in the middle. And if you put it on the top of a picture frame and the bubble isn't directly in the center or you put it on the shelf that you're trying to install to make sure it's even and it's not, then you have to make the appropriate adjustment. That's exactly what we have in the inside of the ear. Okay. All right. Let's, that's cranial nerve eight. <clears throat> cranial nerve nine is the glossopharyngeal. Remember seven was sweet, sour, salty seven. Glossopharyngeal cranial nerve nine is bitter back nine. It controls the back of the tongue for the taste of the sense of bitter. So it's bitter back nine because it's the posterior one third of the tongue. Okay. Cranial nerve nine is also involved with the gag reflex. So if you touch the, the uvula or the back of the throat, all of a sudden the throat closes up. That is the glossopharyngeal. Cranial nerve nine is kind of like the sensory part to that. And it links in with cranial nerve 10, which is the motor part to shut that down. So cranial nerve nine and 10 work together for the gag reflex. Nine is sensory, 10 is motor. So what is 10? 10 is the vagal nerve. Vagal nerve is super important. I believe it is my favorite cranial nerve. If you look at it, the term vagus comes from the word vagrant and a vagrant person is one that wanders or wanders around. So this 10th cranial nerve goes to the heart, the lungs, the stomach, the kidney, the liver, right? It goes to 90% of the organs. So the vagal nerve makes up about 90% of your parasympathetic nervous system. There's actually four cranial nerves. If you think back to sympathetic and parasympathetic, sympathetic is fight or flight response. It's called the thoracolumbar outflow because it goes from T1 to L2, thoracolumbar. And then you have craniosacral, which is parasympathetic. Parasympathetic is the cranio for cranial nerves, sacral for sacrum, but it's cranial nerves three, seven, nine, and 10. Three, seven, nine, and 10. So oculomotor, three, facial, seven, glossopharyngeal, nine, and vagus is 10. That's the cranial division. And sacral division is S234. Parasympathetics is feed and breed or rest and digest, rest and digest. So three, seven, nine, and 10 is parasympathetic with cranial nerve 10, the vagal nerve making up 90% of that. Why do I, is that my favorite cranial nerve? Because when I deliver a treatment to my patients and I'm working on the upper cervical region, C1 and C2, I can make an adjustment there, which affects the medulla. And remember what cranial nerves are located in the medulla, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 10, vagal nerve. So this is why oftentimes you may hear of a family member or friend that may say, you know, it's the darnest thing. I went to the chiropractor with neck pain and all of a sudden my digestion got better or that arrhythmia or that imbalance with the heart improved. I wonder if there's any connection. Or we have brand new mothers that deliver a baby and it was traumatic birth or very forceful on the baby with the pulling of the neck and rotation of the neck and they subluxate the atlas vertebra, which is C1. And all of a sudden the baby's not thriving because they can't hold down breast milk. And as the, the milk goes in, it starts to accumulate and then all of a sudden it's not going down, stimulates the gag reflex and the baby projectile vomits. So it's a 10th cranial nerve or a vagal nerve irritation because the vagal nerve controls the sphincters between the esophagus and the stomach. It's called a cardiac sphincter or the lower esophageal sphincter. So when there's neurological irritation there, due to subluxation of the atlas interfering with the medulla affecting the vagal nerve, anything that you see down in this picture can be affected. Digestion, stomach, acids in the stomach, constipation, bowel movements, uh, cardiac, respiratory. The cardiac and respiratory center do lie in the medulla oblongata. So that vagal nerve, I've had patients where I've done pre and post blood pressure checks and I can get a 20 point drop within five minutes of time. And the medications at best, maybe 10, 
10 millimeters of mercury of pressure, maybe 12 at best that the medications can reduce. So many times blood pressure can be a biomechanical issue creating a neurological interference, creating visceral and organic imbalances. And that's really what most diseases are, right? It's an imbalance of something working too fast or too little. So that 10th cranial nerve, the vagal is super important. When you look at cranial nerve 11, the accessory or spinal accessory nerve, that controls two important muscles, the SCM and the trapezius. So rotating the head and shrugging the shoulders is cranial nerve 11. Cranial nerve 12 is the hypoglossal that moves the tongue around, okay? <clears throat> okay, so here is a picture of looking at the inferior view of the brain, and you could see the olfactory nerve, cranial nerve one here. We could see the optic nerve, cranial nerve two is here. Where they crisscross in the center is the optic chiasm. Remove the A, it, you know, it's most books call it the optic chiasm, not the optum chiasma. So the optic chiasm, just remove the, the A. Here's the pituitary gland. So that's why when the pituitary gland enlarges, it could put pressure on the optic chiasm interfering with vision. Okay. And there's a close up view of the olfactory. And this is why protecting the nose is so important that you wanna keep your hands clean because if you do something like this and there happens to be a virus or bacteria on your hand, now it's in the epithelium and mucosal membrane of the nose, it hits, it moves up and it's the olfactory nerve is going to be able to transmit that into the brain. So you have to be really careful with that. Here's another silly mnemonic. It's a little bit different than the one I gave you on OOO to touch and feel very good velvet. Ah, these are the 12 cranial nerves. Some say marry money, but my brother says big brains matters most. The S is for sensory, the M is for motor, and the B is for both, meaning sensory and motor. If you wanna help understand, does it have sensory function or motor function? All right, let's take a look at the eye here. Some of the major parts to the eye. You can see some of the muscles here. Here's the superior rectus. Here's the inferior rectus. Uh, here is the superior oblique muscle. And then here's the inferior oblique muscle. Uh, here is the lateral cantus of the eye. Here is the medial cantus of the eye. Here's the lacrimal gland. And then here are the lacrimal ducts. So this is cranial nerve nine that controls the lacrimal gland that produces your tears. And tears flow in this direction, right? It goes from superior lateral and it moves inferior and medial and drains in here to get inside the nose, right? And the, the filthy liquid, because the eyes and tears are pretty dirty, it drains into the nose and because it's so uh, dirty, you'll have a histamine reaction in the nose and histamine swells everything up and then you sound all nasal. So here's the lateral cantus, here is the medial cantus, the pupil, the colored portion is the iris, the corneal limbus is that layer around the periphery, the sclera is the uh, white of the eye that we see here and here. Again, here's the lacrimal gland, here are the lacrimal ducts, and you could see the black arrows indicate the direction that the flows will tear as they start to make it way through the inferior meatus. So these are the turbinates, the superior middle and inferior turbinate, right here, here, and here, and in between are the meatus or the cavities between. So it's going to drain out below the inferior concha or inferior turbinate, which is the inferior meatus. And then these things swell and you start to sound all nasal. Let's look at uh, the eye model. You could see the muscles, the superior rectus, lateral rectus, what cranial nerve goes to the lateral rectus, abducens, cranial nerve six, what muscle goes to the inferior oblique, cranial nerve three, 
what muscle goes to the superior oblique? Cranial nerve four. So four is superior oblique, six is abducens, and the other four eye muscles are cranial nerve three, oculomotor. The iris is the colored portion, the pupil is the dark. Remember the pupil can dilate and constrict. It constricts when the sympathetics are stimulated. That is um, the thoracolumbar outflow. And when it dilates, it relaxes when your parasympathetics are stimulated. Radial muscles dilate, circular muscles constrict. The radial muscles pull it apart, dilation. The circular muscles allow it to constrict. The cornea is this uh, clear section. It's an extension of the sclera. So you have the sclera, that's the white part. And then as you come to the forward portion, here is the cornea, okay? Now the cornea is not the lens. Don't confuse that for the lens. So let's take a look here. Um, so here is the sclera, which is the outer portion. And then the clear translucent part in the front is the cornea, which we can see here. So you have the sclera and the cornea. That is the external layer. We could see it here again. Here is the sclera and here is the cornea. The lens is here, right? And then there's this chamber in the front, which is called the anterior compartment that is made of the aqueous humor that is here. The posterior compartment, which is on this side of the lens, that's the posterior compartment. That's the vitreous humor. And then when you start to hear of glaucoma, this is where the pressure and the drainage of this fluid that's found in the vitreous humor and aqueous humor, where there's improper drainage and it puts lots of pressure on the optic nerve and can create blindness as people get a little bit older. So the pupil is in the center, the iris is the color portion. Here's the ciliary muscle. The ciliary muscle constricts the eye. The radial muscles dilate the eye. There are actually three different layers to the eye. Let me see if I can show it to you here. A little bit easier showing you the three layers. I put them in a red box here. So the outer layer is the sclera. The middle layer is the choroid. And then the internal layer is the retina. And that's where your receptors lie. So you have sclera, choroid, which is pretty vascular, and then you have the retina, which is the internal layer, just to put it in perspective. So pupil, iris, colored portion, mine are green, some people have brown, some people have blue. Then you have the ciliary muscles, also known as the circular muscles that's involved with um, constricting the eye. Here's the sclera. The, the next layer in is the choroid, that's the vascular layer. And then deep to that would be the retina, which is where you have the rods and the cones. So here is the sclera, here is the iris, here is the lens. Now the lens is held in by the suspensory ligaments that are almost an extension of these muscles here called the ciliary muscle. Okay, you can see right here, ciliary muscle, which is part of the ciliary body. But there's then these tendons or, or like suspensory ligaments that come off of it that attach to the lens that can alter its shape for vision. The retina is the innermost layer here. And here's the lens. And the front is the aqueous humor and the back side is the vitreous humor. Now here, you can see the choroid, which is the middle layer right here. And then deep to that is the retina, the inner part. So you can see the middle portion and you can see the internal portion. You can see the optic disc right here. The optic di disc is where you have the optic nerve, you have arteries and veins. The eye is the only place in the body that you can look with a fundoscope and actually see arteries, veins, and nerves without cutting open the human body, okay? And that you can pick up a lot of metabolic issues of the human body, especially diabetes and high blood pressure and things of that nature by looking at the ratio of the artery to the vein in terms of diameter of those vessels. Um, in this portion here is the macula, 
and the fovea centralis. Here is where the lens sits. So you can see the ciliary muscle here. Here's the ciliary muscles. And now you can see the lens with those suspensory ligaments attaching to the lens. Here's the pupil. Here is the cornea. So light's gonna shine through the cornea, through the pupil. It's going to hit the lens and the shape of the lens can alter. And then the light and the visual input comes through and hits the rods and the cones, which are the receptors in the back of the eye. Here's the macula and the fovea centralis, which is this portion here. I think they refer to that as the blind spot. And then here's your optic disc. I'm sorry, the blind spot is here, which is your optic disc. I had a junior moment there, my bad. Here is the optic nerve, and then you have the veins, the central artery, and the vein of the retina. So here's the visual axis. You can see input coming through the cornea. Here's the iris through the pupil, through the lens, and it comes straight back and hits the fovea, right? And the macula is just around it. Here is the optic disc. Here's your optic nerve. Here's the artery and the vein. Here's your suspensory ligaments. Here's your ciliary body or the ciliary muscle. Here are the muscles of the eye that we can see the superior rectus. On the bottom, can't quite see, but you'd have the inferior rectus. On the top is the superior oblique. On the bottom is the inferior oblique. Medial rectus on the inside, lateral rectus on the outside. The white part is the sclera. Here is the iris, and here is the pupil. Superior oblique, SO4, cranial nerve 4, trochlear. Lateral rectus, abducens, cranial nerve 6. And all the other four eye muscles are cranial nerve 3 for the oculomotor. This just gives you a better orientation of the superior oblique, how it goes right through the trochlea. That's why SO4, superior oblique, is the trochlear nerve. And on the bottom is the inferior oblique. Let's take a look at the ear. When we look at the ear, we have sound waves coming in through the pina of the ear, also known as the auricle. That would be like the outer part of a funnel. So the sound waves come in into the external acoustic meatus. It's going to hit the tympanic membrane the tympanic membrane is going to oscillate or vibrate. It's going to send that vibration into these three smallest bones of the body called the malus, incus, and the stapes. The malus, incus, and the stapes, the three smallest bones of the body. It's going to vibrate, send that oscillation into the cochlear portion. And here is the cochlea where we have the receptors for hearing. And there's fluid in here with these little hairs, and it's going to oscillate those hairs and the fluid and stimulate the cochlear portion of the vestibulocochlear nerve. This is the vestibular portion of the vestibulocochlear nerve going to the semicircular canals, which control your balance. Remember, we said there's fluid in there, and there's three canals. There's an anterior canal, a posterior canal, and a lateral canal. Here is the malus, the incus, and the stapes. Here are the semicircular canals. This is the anterior canal, the posterior canal, and the horizontal canal, also known as the lateral canal. Here is the cochlear. Here's the cochlear branch for hearing, cochlear branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. And here's the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. What cranial nerve follows and travels with it? You could see the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve seven that travels through that same foramen in the internal acoustic meatus. Here is the model of the ear, but you could see the pina or the auricle. Here's the external auditory meatus. Here's your tympanic membrane. You have your malus. We have the incus. And then we have the stapes. Here are the three semicircular canals. And here is the cochlear. This sits in the petrous portion of the temporal bone. That's what covers this apparatus. 
Here's the eustachian tube. This is where you hold your nose and you blow and it, it changes the shape of the, ex, of the tympanic membrane when your ears get clogged due to change in atmospheric pressure. Here's a bird's eye view. Sound waves come in, hit the tympanic membrane. Here's the malus, incus, and the stapes. The stapes attaches to the oval window, right, to the vestibule. Here are the three semicircular canals. Here's the anterior canal, the posterior canal, and the lateral canal, also known as the transverse canal. Here's the vestibule. Sometimes we get little calcium stones that get lodged in here. And this creates that mechanical problem of the, parox the benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, which is a mechanical problem for the most part that can be corrected. Most people use motion sickness medication. They're on it for years and years. They come to my office, they're fixed in five minutes, they kick themselves in the butt as to why they didn't try it any sooner. <clears throat> Here is the cochlear for hearing. Here is the cochlear portion, and here is the vestibular portion. So you have the vestibulo-cochlear nerve. Again, if we just isolate and take out the apparatus, here is the tympanic membrane, malus incus stapes, oval window, vestibule, here's the anterior canal, posterior canal, and the lateral canal, all for different movement. So when you move your head forward, that's the anterior canal. When you move your head back, lateral canal, and when you rotate left and right, it's the lateral canal or transverse canal. Here's the cochlear. Here's the cochlear nerve, vestibular nerve, vestibular cochlear is what it's referred to together as cranial nerve eight. Okay, and to just finish up, here is the neuron altogether. In another video, I think it showed it separate. So the three main, main, main parts, right? We have dendrites, which bring information into the cell body or known as the soma. And then the axon is where the information is sent away. So you have dendrites, cell body, and axon. The axon is protected by the myelin, the myelin is produced by the Schwann cell. The Schwann cell myelinates in the peripheral neural system. This here is just the nucleus of the Schwann cell. Where one Schwann cell and another Schwann cell come together, there's that little indentation here. We also see it here and here. That's the node of Ranvier. The layer that protects this um, neuron is gonna be the endoneurium. Over here is that axon hillock, also known as the initial segment or trigger zone, which is where depolarization starts right there before it becomes that full axon. And then those little vessels, this is where the axon terminal is that stores the neurotransmitters. So this is an axon terminal synapsing with a neuron. Axon terminal, good enough, right? Just understand that there are neurotransmitters that are stored there. Some neurotransmitters are excitatory, some are inhibitory. I'll give you an example, um, right? The chemical messengers of the body are either gonna be neurotransmitters or hormones. Neurotransmitters are released by the, uh, in the neural system, hormones by the endocrine system. But whether they're hormones or neurotransmitters, they're either excitatory or inhibitory. Okay, so um, when you get up in the morning and your alarm goes off, you wanna spring out of bed, get right out, that's because of the excitatory neurotransmitters in the brain, specifically called glutamate. Glutamate is the accelerator. As the day goes on and it's nighttime and you wanna sleep, glutamate gets converted to GABA, gamma amino butyric acid, GABA, that's the break or the inhibitory neurotransmitter. So if you get up in the morning and you need to hit the snooze button, oh, just give me five more minutes, just five more minutes, I wanna sleep. That means your glutamate isn't firing as it should. You could be glutamate deficient. And maybe you're GABA dominant in the morning when you shouldn't be. At nighttime, when you wanna to go to sleep, you wanna be GABA dominant, but if your brain is all stimulated and excited, it means you're glutamate dominant instead of GABA. You also need to have healthy B vitamins to convert glutamate to GABA. So if you're lacking B vitamins or your nutrition is off balance and you don't have a good amount of your B vitamins and you can't convert glutamate to GABA, 
that can also lead to this. So these neurotransmitters are stored in the axon terminal and then they're released. You're familiar with that because we've already covered muscles and you learned about the neuromuscular junction. And we said acetylcholine or ACH is that excitatory neurotransmitter at the neuromuscular junction. But there's lots of neurotransmitters, right? There's serotonin and there's dopamine and the list goes on and on and on. Okay, and to finish up, just to review the reflex arc, something has to touch your skin. There are receptors within the skin that receive that stimulation. So the first part is the receptor. It sends that information through an afferent neuron, which is a sensory neuron. The sensory neuron relays that information to the association neuron, AKA interneuron. That information is then sent to a motor neuron, which is called an efferent neuron. And then its final destination is the effector. So those are the five parts, receptor, sensory neuron, interneuron or association neuron, motor neuron, and the effector. We know that sensory and afferent are interchangeable terms and motor and efferent are interchangeable terms. So that brings a close to our neurology.